Hey, honey. Yes, Barry? Let's get out of here. Where are we going? Where do we always go? Hasta encontrar la playa Por eso grito al mundo Yo soy de Puerto Vallarta Samba de Puerto Vallarta Noche de arrullo en el mar Samba de Puerto Vallarta Hello, fellow travelers, and welcome to this episode of the Puerto Vallarta Travel Show. I am your host, Barry Kessler, and I'm just so happy to be introducing you to my favorite vacation destination. Maybe it's even yours, and it's Puerto Vallarta, Mexico. That music you're listening to is performed by Alberto Perez, and Mr. Perez is the owner of the La Palapa Group of Restaurants here in Puerto Vallarta. Those are the La Palapa, the El Dorado Beach Club. And at night for dinner, that El Dorado transforms into the ever-so-romantic Vista Grill with dramatic views of the Los Muertos Pier all lit up at night in beautiful colors. And of course, at La Palapa, you can enjoy that same view of the Los Muertos Pier all day long for breakfast, lunch, or dinner, seated with your toes in the sand right at the water's edge. It's so romantic. It's so Puerto Vallarta, my friends. This week, I have a really great guest to introduce to you. His name is Connor Watts, and Connor is the owner of Puerto Vallarta's very first craft beer brewery. Uh, It's called Los Muertos Brewing, and it's located on the south side of PV. But first, let's see what's happening this week in Puerto Vallarta, the 4th of July, 2018. First of all, happy 4th of July to all you fellow Americans out there. And, uh, hey, let's not forget that Canada Day was just a week, uh, just earlier this week, on the 1st of July. Uh, So, happy Canada Day to all my Canadian friends and listeners out there. And uh, the Mexicans went to the polls, actually, on the 1st of July. They, They celebrated Canada Day in a different way. They elected a new president. His name is Andres Manuel López Obrador. And Obrador is the former mayor of Mexico City. Uh, He won in a landslide, 53% of the vote. And, uh, well, he is considered to be a leftist. And he has actually expressed a willingness to negotiate with President Trump over NAFTA, which he actually was a very big critic of at its inception. So this is going to be interesting to see how things develop over the coming months Uh, It's certainly something to be keeping our eyes out for. Uh, Now, what was very interesting about this election day in Puerto Vallarta was that the local authorities suspended the laws prohibiting the sale of alcohol on election day. Uh, Now, in Mexico, sometimes uh, the sale of alcohol is prohibited for 24 hours, sometimes 48 hours uh, before the elections and during election day, depending on the municipality. and uh, But in Vallarta, they changed the rules, and the party never stopped. How about that? All right, so uh, last week on June 29th, uh, Puerto Vallarta got a little bit of a rock and roll shake from an earthquake. It happened at 8.56 p.m. It was a magnitude 5.9, and it was centered in the Pacific Ocean, a little bit south of Puerto Vallarta, 51 miles from Manzanillo. Uh, that's down in Colima, Mexico. There were no reports of injury or damage to our precious Puerto Vallarta. Uh, just a lot of rattled nerves, followed by massive amounts of tequila, and then followed by massive amounts of hangovers. <laughs> Film at 11. So, um, a couple weeks back, I heard about a woman being injured parasailing in Vallarta. This was about the time that Hurricane Bud was passing by. And um, at the time, I had heard that the boat had uh, flipped and that the tow rope had actually 
come loose, broken loose from the boat, and the woman had basically, you know, I figured that she had just kind of fallen, you know, into the ocean or something like that and, you know, broke a couple bones, but I didn't hear this story. Uh, Let's read here from CBS News. To celebrate her 29th birthday, Katie Malone strapped into a parasail in Puerto Vallarta, Mexico on June 9th and braced herself for an adventure high above the water. The first few minutes went fine, but at some point in the ride, Malone saw that the boat supposedly pulling her along was getting going one way and she was flying in the other direction, approaching land. The line connecting them had snapped, she realized, and her terrifying flight ended when Malone crash-landed about 45 minutes later at an airport nearly two miles away. Her brother, Brendan Malone, told CNN on Thursday. The crash left her with a broken pelvis, four broken ribs, a collapsed lung, and a blow to the left left hand side of her face, he said. But his sister is alive. After 18 days in a Mexican hospital, Malone returned to the U.S. on Tuesday for more treatment at UCSD Medical Center in San Diego. She has had three surgeries so far, and she remains in the hospital and is doing well, the family said. We're moving up and up, and she's doing just doing so well, and she's so strong, Brendan Malone said. She's very lucky to be alive. Despite the injuries, the crash could have been worse for Malone. At one point, she came close to hitting one of the balconies at the resort, so close that she could hear the people screaming. Uh, After the line connecting her to the boat broke, she started traveling down the coastline. From previous skydiving experiences, she knew to use her feet as an anchor, so she grabbed the rope with her feet put her hands in the air, and steered the parasail as best she could with her feet, her brother said. She was praying the whole time for her safety. She was mostly concerned about breaking her arms and legs, Malone said. She passed out about 20 minutes in. Whoa. Even after Malone crash-landed, there were more issues, her brother said. An alligator, I'm guessing it was actually a crocodile, Uh, was by the fence near where she landed, and rescue workers had to scare the beast away to reach her. When family told her about the alligator, which is not an alligator, it's a crocodile, Malone says she laughed and thought it was hilarious, Brendan Malone said. Her family later watched the video of the terrifying flight that was filmed by one of her friends. I just fell down watching it, Malone's mother said. It was great to see her, though. She's very lucky to be alive, and we're really thankful for that. Uh, U.S. Representative Duncan Hunter and his father, former U.S. Representative Duncan Hunter, helped facilitate Malone's return to the United States. Brendan Malone said his sister was in high spirits during her time in the Mexican hospital. It was unbelievable. Throughout her stay, the doctors and nurses kept asking her what her pain level was, and she would say, 8 to 10, he said. When she was ready to get in the ambulance to start her journey back to the U.S., the doctors and the nurses kept asking her about her pain level. She said she didn't feel any pain at all. Uh, The family has received offers of help in terms of possible legal action against the parasailing company, according to Brandon Malone. Okay, so wow. (laughs) Uh, Have any of you ever gone parasailing? I mean, I look at that. I've never really wanted to go parasailing. Um, I've heard stories, good and bad. I've heard people just love it, and I've heard some horror stories. Uh, And, you know, I don't know. Do you you think that this parasailing company is going to get sued? I don't know. I don't know. But let this be a warning to you. This lady had no traveler's insurance. Now, I don't know if traveler's insurance would have helped her in a parasailing incident. Actually, I I reached out to Michael uh, Keller of Guardian Insurance a little bit too late. So I'm going to talk to him about that another time. But but wow, 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 wow. Uh, You know, when I went, by by the way, I have a video um, of, um, well, of this event. And I also 
have, when I was doing that search, looking for this video, I noticed that there were lots of accidents that have been recorded on YouTube, on the YouTubers, um, of people getting, you know, slammed into buildings. Just, it's it's pretty awful. I, I dare you to go on YouTube and look for parasailing accidents. Um, there are many. So anyway, let that be a lesson to all of you people who love to go parasailing. That it's, um, it looks like a lot of fun, but I don't know. I got two five-star reviews from listeners in iTunes this week. So thank you. Thank you very much, you guys. Uh, one of them is from uh, CP. CP says, Puerto Vallarta can be overwhelming with all there is to do. Decisions, decisions. With Barry's own experiences and the great interviews with the people, it humanizes it all and makes decision-making for your own experience fun. I already have my list going for when I come down again. As a bonus, listening each week, I can almost feel like I'm back in PV. Thanks, Barry. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the other one reads, uh, this is from Veg Trish, also from the US of A. So glad I found your podcast. I've been coming to PV and surrounding areas for 19 years, and I look forward to our two-week visit every year. While it's hard being away, your podcast gives me a little taste of home, and I look forward to to each and every one. Thanks, Barry. Trish. All right. Well, thank you, Trish. And thanks to you, CP. You know, I love, I love five-star reviews. And you guys have, you really have no idea how much it, it really means to me. Uh, so thank you. Thank you so much. Now, remember last week we talked about the execution of Emperor Maximilian of Mexico? Well, if you didn't catch that one, go back and listen to it. Um, it's in the beginning of the, of the podcast, if you don't want to listen to the whole thing. Uh, but I got a note from Randall who writes, this is a favorite period of Mexican history for me. After Maximiliano was deposed, his French soldiers were left stranded in Mexico by Napoleon III. Many settled in Los Altos de Jalisco, where my wife was born. Uh, this is one reason for the preponderance of European Mexican Guerreros in the region. This was confirmed by a discussion that I had in Arianas, Jalisco in 2002 with a UCLA sociology graduate student who researched and verified this. It should also be stated that Maximiliano was not deserving of his fate. True, he was recruited by Napoleon III to be his puppet in Mexico. However, both Maximiliano and Empress Carlota loved Mexico and during their reign implemented positive changes, especially in Mexico City. All right, well, thanks for that, Randall. It's very interesting regarding the French soldiers that were left behind by Napoleon III and, of course, their descendants living there in Jalisco. And yes... You are absolutely right. It was a tragic, tragic end to, to the life of Maximilian. Uh, and he was, he was such a young guy. I mean, he, he, was, uh, he was executed. He was only 34 years old. Only 34 years old. Um, so, yeah, there, there is so much more to this story. And you know what? I'm going to definitely take it up another day. But until then, hold my beer. Let's get on with the interview, shall we? Now, I love beer. I mean, who doesn't? But I have to say that for the most part, Mexican beers, while they're, they're some of my favorites, like Modelo and Pacifico and Corona, they're fine. But from time to time, you just you need a little something a little bit sturdier, a fine, fine craft beer, something that's made in smaller batches and with care. And my next guest is uh, the first guy to bring craft beer to Puerto Vallarta. Uh, he was suggested by a couple of my listeners, and he's a favorite of many of my guests, who, as you know, every week I ply their favorite eateries and drinkeries from them, and I make them name them, right? And, I, and we talk about them. So anyway, this place comes up all the time. So it's my great pleasure 
to take you to the corner of Calle Constitution and Lazaro Cardenas, and let's have a seat at a table right smack dab in the middle of a place, a really nice place called Los Muertos Brewing. And let's meet the owner, Connor Watts. Connor, thanks for inviting me to your place. It's a pleasure to have you. Listen, uh, why don't you tell my listeners a little bit about yourself. What was, what was your path to Puerto Vallarta? I got married in Puerto Vallarta in 2009. And at our wedding, my wife told all of our friends that one day we would live down here. And I came upon an opportunity to sell the business that I had in Park City, Utah within the first two months of being married. And upon selling that, I sold everything else and my wife and I moved down here for our first anniversary. Dude, so you did what a lot of people do. Um, Usually they do it when they're getting ready to retire. You had other plans, right? I did not come down here to retire, no. I originally, when we decided that we had the opportunity to move and my wife was tired of living in a cold climate, we started considering what our options were. And without any direction, we didn't want to just move to Florida or San Diego or Arizona. or We even tossed around Hawaii. But uh, to move somewhere just for the sake of moving somewhere didn't seem quite right. So we wanted to challenge ourselves a little more. And we always told people that we were going to move to Vallarta, so why not? It would be a, uh, a language experience, a culture experience, and a totally different lifestyle than anything we would have found anywhere that I can think of in the United States. So we, we did it, and we came down here. We didn't really have a direction. My wife was working for a Utah-based company called Vacation Roost, who had a... Uh, a division down here in Vallarta. And that was an opportunity for us to have a little bit of income while we were down here bumming around and (laughs) sitting in the sand and watching sunsets and drinking margaritas and whatnot. And uh, so she was, she was definitely the one to support us when we first came down. Okay. So um, are you a brewer by trade? I started brewing when I was about 18 years old, going to school at the university of Colorado. Um, I don't know if that incriminates me in some way, but that's how I started. And at the height of my brewing, I was brewing 20 to 30 gallons a month. I was just a home brewer, but I would have a bunch of friends that would ask me to brew for their uh, weddings or other parties. We always had a bunch of beer for the opening day football game of the Utah Utes football team. I was living in Park City at, 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 the, at the height of my brewing. And... I had I, I had aspirations to do it commercially, but I never had any interest in doing that in Utah. There was uh, rules that didn't really jive yeah, with what what's I. What's with that Utah thing? <laughs> hmm. There's scratching my head. There's um, you can clearly get a drink in Utah, but the rules are not designed perfectly for people understanding all the rules, and specifically with. Uh, fabrication or elaboration of any sort of alcohol, there's a different set of rules. So in order to make a beer that was higher than 3.2% alcohol, which all of my beers are, I would have to bottle it, sell it to the state, physically transfer it to them and buy it back in order to sell it in a brew pub. And for me, a brew pub requires beer on draft, basically all beer on draft. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so that didn't really Jive, right? And so people, I, I did have a restaurant, uh, a bar restaurant, and we specialized in a New York style thing, crust pizza. And people asked me very consistently, "Why don't you brew and have your beer here?" And I said, "Well, that's that's far enough away from illegal that I'm not willing to risk my entire livelihood to to be able to sell you a beer. And when you're brewing at such a small scale." You have to sell a beer for so much to make it anywhere close to worth your time that uh, that it's it's impossible. Okay, so here you've got what I would consider a pretty large scale brewing operation. Um, tell us a little bit about what you got going here. 
Well, so when we came down here, we, I thought that the big thing that Vallarta was missing was any sort of craft beer at all. So now what year was that? That was in... Two, we, we moved down here uh, in the fall of 2010 and basically spent the next six months to a year deciding what we wanted to be when we grew up. And uh, the, the offering that we have here from from the food to the atmosphere to the beer, uh, basically touched the three things that I felt was most missing in, in Vallarta. So I went to work in Colorado at a place called Cooper Smith's uh, in Fort Collins, Colorado. And basically that was my professional experience before diving in and doing it myself. Mm -hmm. So uh, the experience I had with them and the capacity that we had as far as uh, tables and future tables that I saw, I came up with the idea of having the system that we have here. I expected it to be to have a little bit of extra capacity from what we could serve within these four walls, and I was kind of right <laughs> and kind of not. Like we we did we brewed to 100% capacity for the first time this last winter. Mm -hmm. So the first couple years, uh, we started a little slow. We, did, we had some issues with our equipment, basically our cooling. So our beer was far from excellent the first year. Mm -hmm. And then, it got, and then we've, we remedied that problem, and then it got better and better and better to basically every batch. We were always refining our process and doing everything better. And I think we're at about... 250, 260 batches right now in the, in the history of Los Muertos. And because we weren't touching our capacity in those early years, we started coming up with off-premise clients and trying to figure out what to do with our extra capacity of beer. And fortunately, we didn't pursue that super aggressively because we can't really service them other than when they don't really want the service, which is right now <laughs> today's date is may 13th right exactly so things are slowing down a little bit and they're not they're not looking for the uh, overflow exactly so uh, it's a little bit unfortunate i uh, one of my mentors or one of my uh, better clients is a board member of the mammoth brewing company in in mammoth lakes california and they have the same exact thing where in the winter they've got plenty of capacity to serve their local market and in the summer they want to build their their statewide markets that aren't necessarily local to the the upper sierras i don't, I don't know mm -hmm. what you would actually call that region um but you can't really develop clients and then tell them sorry we don't have beer for you for four to six months right um so so we 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 were pretty conservative on our sales effort basically you had to come to us right and you had to come to us a couple times and show genuine interest and uh now we we, we still have about a a dozen outlets that serve our beer some of them serve a lot and some of them serve very little mm -hmm. All right, so these tanks here, um, they came from somewhere. So we built our brewery here in our brewery. Okay. The only tanks that weren't built in these walls uh, were the fermentation tanks, which actually were done in Guadalajara. And then there is one tank, it's our mash tun, and it's actually bigger than the walls are for this building, so we had to build that here too. But all of our serving tanks or bright tanks or cellar tanks, whatever you want to call them, uh, were built within these four walls. And uh, if, you, if you come to the brewery, you can look at the floor and there's a, there, there's a square outline, square metal outline, and that was the hole that we were able to build the tanks on the first floor and then lower a dozen of them down into our basement. And that was cool, and it's a really cool story, but uh, we learned a lot. Um, it, was the uh, it was the first time I ever had built a brewery, let alone supervise the actual building of the tanks, so I knew a lot of things in theory that needed to be done, yeah. but not having had the experience, we, we left a little bit on the table. So uh, it still makes good beer, but it's a little bit of a, a pain for our brewers. Um, <laughs> 
which includes me. Uh, a little bit less these days. I've I've got a guy who's doing most the the lion's share of the the brewing these days until he goes on vacation, and then I actually have to get my hands dirty a little bit again. Yeah. But um, but we are actually getting ready to build another brewery that we're probably going to move 100% of our operation to because our mm-hmm. our brewery there is going to work uh, perfectly, basically. Mm-hmm. Or that that's the intention is for it to work perfectly. And we're not even going to have to worry about some of the mistakes that we made here because we are buying them from professionals instead of stainless steel guys who live in Mexico. Huh. Uh, the beautiful thing about hiring stainless steel guys that live in Mexico is it's a little more affordable than the next brewery, but um, but I think the next brewery is going to uh, pay for itself in efficiency and, and safety and, and quality and consistency of beer. Yeah, so more of this, uh, you said you had problems with keeping it cool last time. So uh, when you first started, it must be really hard to keep things cool here. We, um, it's all about electricity, I suppose. Yeah. And um, when we when we first re- when we first opened, we thought that we would be able to have a glycol tank in our cold room, and that would be cold because the room was cold, and then we could pump it around and it'd stay cold enough. And uh, that sort of worked for our very first beer. And that was fine, but the more we actually started brewing, the more that glycol was out of that room and really not an ideal temperature because that room uh, at best is zero degrees Celsius or 32 Fahrenheit. And uh, you really want your glycol to be colder than that, which it will never be. And, and when you're pumping it around into a room that might be 90 degrees, it, uh, it just gets warmer and warmer and warmer, yeah. which uh, it does not allow you to control your fermentation temperatures, which is key to making a good beer. So that was an easy solution. You need a glycol chiller, and you need to put that up on your roof or somewhere, uh, somewhere where air can circulate. Yeah. And uh, the, that was an easy fix. However... Um, I didn't know enough about electricity and our glycol chiller wasn't compatible with the power that we had in our building. So I, after I got the machine, then I had to proceed to fight with the CFE, the electric, uh, electric company in Mexico, um, to allow us to connect it because yeah. it was three-phase power, which the transformer that we got for our building is not. And... Um, Generally speaking, you're not allowed to have two power accounts. Mm. So, so it, was, it was a big fight, but luckily for us, we're on a corner, so we actually do have two addresses. And when we, when we told that, when we, we were eventually able to talk our way into it, and we, we couldn't accept no for an answer because we would have been stuck making very mediocre beer forever. Yeah, and no bueno. And no bueno. Happens. No bueno. All right, what kind of beers are you making here? Uh, we have a pretty standard rotation of seven beers, and that goes from our Mexicana Rubia, which is what we consider our Pacifico or Modelo or Macro Lager replacement, all the way through a stout, which is, uh, you know, as far as the... Ri- color rainbow goes the lightest to the darkest and then we have everything in between from different levels of maltiness and different colors and different flavors and different hoppiness so our our standard line is uh, a blonde a wheat a chili ale which we ferment on uh, serrano peppers half of which are roasted and half of which are raw And that's a love it or hate it sort of beer. But even the people who love it are still pretty much only going to drink a pint. Mm-hmm. Um, because after a while, it, it, starts, to, it starts to get Burn. a little built up. Um, <laughs> and then one of our best-selling beers is our Amber Ale. It's, uh, it, it's a, sort of a transitional beer for a lot of people. If, you, if you're drinking 
macro Mexican lagers and you want to try something that has a little bit more flavor, our amber ale is, is not overly bitter, not, over, not too much hoppy character, and a lot of what you're getting is the flavor from the malts. And the nuttiness and the biscuitiness are flavors that are a really good natural complement for beer in general. Mm-hmm. And it, it, it sort of gets people tasting their beer. A lot of people for sort of the first time. And me, as, as a longtime beer drinker, I still enjoy drinking that beer also. It's, it, it's not so alcoholic that you can't drink several. And it's not so flavorful that your tongue just sort of explodes after the the second or third. I, I'm very much an IPA drinker, uh, which is the next beer on our line. But I, no matter how much I like an IPA and no matter how good the opportunity is for drinking cool, fun, exciting IPAs, uh, at three, four, five... Uh, based off normally elevated levels of alcohol and the massive flavor that you're getting out of that hop, like I, my my palate just can't handle it beyond that. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a pretty common thing. All right, what's an IPA? Uh, an IPA, if you don't know what it is, is a beer that you don't want to order. It stands for India Pale Ale, and it is very much stronger than the majority of beers and it is very much it has way more ibus which is international bittering units Mm -hmm. which is a measure for how bitter a beer is and uh an ipa can range from 60 70 all the way up to something like 120 if you we we don't try to push those limits of something that's that that's got that much hop in it, but it has been done. And those, uh, even the, even the strongest beer drinkers uh, or IPA lovers, uh, there, you can you can get to a limit. And I think especially in California, probably about five years ago, five ten years ago, there was a race to see who could make the beer so bitter that nobody could drink it. And I don't know who won, but I think that uh, I think that a lot of brewers are like, all right, this is just silly. It's insane, it, right? It's um, a, a hop is not an inexpensive ingredient, so it, it definitely makes your beers uh, way more expensive to produce, especially when you're really trying to blow everybody's <laughs> tongue out of their mouth. Um, but uh, the the idea of those beers is. Uh, hops and alcohol are both natural preservatives, so they are very stable. But that being said, a fresh IPA is way better than an aged IPA. It won't necessarily be as smooth, but a lot of that character is what makes an IPA great. And the faster you can drink it, the better it's going to be. Because it's not going to be a bad beer as it ages. It's just going to be smoother, and it's going to lose a lot of the character that that people really pay for in an IPA. Mm-hmm. All of our beers we sell for the, for the same price, uh, but it's fairly uncommon for that to happen. We just... Uh, we have enough people that are, that are drinking uh, a Agave Maria or a Mexicana Rubia, that are that are basically the same a, a standard price for beer making that we're able to cost average over everything and not confuse people with different prices for different pints. Oh, okay. So that makes it simple for everybody, doesn't it? Exactly. What are you uh, What are you serving along with uh, with this beer? Well, we we don't have uh, specific pairings, but pretty much any beer drinker knows what food goes best with beer. So our menu is simply described as pub food. And we have uh, burgers and chicken fingers and and salads. And uh, we're most famously known for our pizza. Um, uh, My previous restaurant was very well known for pizza. So I knew a little something coming into that, and I am 
a, I'm a simple cook, uh, definitely not a chef, and was able to write the menu with a bunch of flavors that were easy to source here from a product standpoint. And it took me a while to perfect my, my pizza dough. It, um, I couldn't just take the recipe that I had in the United States and bring right. it down here because the ingredients are different. Um, I actually am extremely proud of the, the dough recipe that we've come up with because I think it is everybody as good as the pizza that we were serving in Utah, um, which should be technically easier um, because everybody, pretty much everybody that's writing recipes and writing books, all those ingredients are very much available in the United States, which they're not in Mexico. Really? I mean, and they're, uh, it's just, it's different brands and different gluten contents and different things like that. So it's, um, it, it, it's not so much uh, that I'm uh, finding super rare things. It's just finding the right combination of the local ingredients. And, you know, for a lot of people, salt is salt is salt. And uh, finding the the correct brand of salt was critically important to having our pizza turn out to what it was. And, and uh, the same thing with our cheeses. Our, our best cheese supplier that we had found is no longer available. Uh-oh. And we've had a couple people tell me that our pizza tastes a little different than it did a year ago. And I applaud them for their perception. Uh, it is very close, but it is, uh, it's not, in my mind, the best, it could possi- the best it's ever possibly been uh, just because we don't have that specific cheese as an option. What happened? What happened? Did the guy die? Or? Uh, no, it was, um, I think it's all about trade and um, trade and, and subsequent taxes. Huh. It was... It, it, Sometimes things are more lucrative to export. Being Mexican cheeses, sometimes things are more uh, appropriate to import. Being U.S. cheeses, um, for whatever reason, the guy the, the guy is still alive. Our our guy, um, he basically just dropped us as a client, and we were buying, in my mind, pretty much enough cheese to support him as his only client yeah. and uh, and give him a a good lifestyle. So. Um, for whatever reason, uh, he he wasn't necessarily totally forthcoming, or he just didn't like us anymore. But we found an ex- acceptable substitute. I think it's every bit as good uh, when it's fresh, but when it's reheated the next day, it doesn't maintain its texture quite as well as I would like. But that just means you need more friends to come in and eat fresh yeah, pizza I say, and finish know, it you off. You shouldn't have any of that stuff left over anyway. Exactly. And in the morning, you don't care. Right, you just eat it. Uh, <laughs> it is a it is a pretty good day after food, also. So yeah, and you know what? Um, all my listeners, whenever I ask them, and I'm going to ask you pretty soon too, what their favorite breakfast, lunch, and dinner places are, uh, Los Muertos always comes up, uh, and so your pizza obviously really ranks high as far as they're concerned. Um, you uh, are in the bar business. You get people in here. Kind of having a little fun every once in a while. You ever see anything crazy happening here? <laughs> Something maybe you want to tell us about? Uh, I don't maybe, know. Uh, uh, what, what's the rating on this uh, program? Well, what, it's, like it's, I, it's, it is a family show, but <laughs> as long as you don't curse, we're all good. Well, one of the things, having had bar experience when we were building this place out, was I the architect originally had planned to build our bathrooms out of sheetrock. And I said, that is not going to happen because I'm pretty proficient at patching sheetrock because even on the slowest nights when you have a sheetrock bathroom, you get some guy who looks down and is unsatisfied with what he sees and he takes it out on the wall and or whatever reason. And it won't even be a crazy night. It'll be a night where you can have nobody in there and you'll go in and be like, I can't believe that just happened. So... um, (laughs) We are fairly family friendly. Uh, when we were organizing the the layout of what we have here and, and everything, I thought it was going to be a bit more of a raucous bar atmosphere. Um, but it really has turned itself into more of a family destination. And that goes from 
tourism clientele all the way through to our Mexican clientele, which is really the key to our success uh, because one of the big benefits of having non-local and local Mexican clientele is they all eat at different times. So people say, I, how, how do you do it? You're always busy. And it's like, well, I'm popular with everybody. So I can have uh, gringos, whether they're living here part-time, full-time, or just here for a week, that are happy to come in and have lunch at 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock. And, the, and then our Mexican clientele comes in to eat sort of af after that and uh and then happy hour happens so everybody likes that and then north of the border origin people like to eat earlier and then mexicans like to eat late um because because of that it, it we we have kids all the time whether it's when we open at 11 or close at midnight and uh, with, uh, with with the kids being in here, it sort of keeps crazy stuff from happening. Yeah. I think the the craziest stuff has all happened with my friends, <laughs> and and I'll have a friend and a good uh, a good customer, and they'll they'll just be chatting with each other, and a topic will come up that both of them are polarized passionate about and it'll almost be to the point where they they come to fisticuffs and it's like we haven't had nearly enough to drink to to have a fight um and like i like this this is not the couple of people that i would have expected to have this problem but the people the craziness of what happens here is is more all about mexico we, You'll be a worker here and somebody will come in and they'll want to sell you the most obscure things, whether that's a pair of underwear or cheese or tacos. Um, one, of our, one of our favorite purveyors as a, as a group of everybody who works here is uh, a street taco guy. He walks around. He's got his own little cart, and it's tacos de Viagra, um, which uh, they're very cheap, so clearly they don't actually have Viagra <laughs> in them. And they have Cerro Grasa, which is without fat. So basically, he, his entire marketing strategy is to offer a product that is not anywhere close to what he's actually offering you. Um, <laughs> And he he yips and whistles, and he he's quite a character, and I'm sure it, it permeates through uh, a lot of other uh, other establishments. And um, any he, he's great. He, if we ever don't see him for several days, he he's the first to admit that. Yeah, I had a I had a really good couple of days. I had a bunch of money in my pocket, so I went on a bender, <laughs> and now I'm out of money, so I'm making tacos again. And he's he's a character. Are they good tacos? Have you tried one? Uh, they have varying degrees of deliciousness. Um, I've had them, and they're they're great. And I've had them, and they're not so great. What does, um, what does your wife think about it when you after? You, never mind. Well, my tacos de Viagra. Yeah, never uh, mind. Never mind. <laughs> All right, so so he's uh, he's hit and miss. Is that what you're trying to say? He's a little hit and miss. I love that guy. He screams at the top of his voice. It's hilarious. It's hilarious. I have to I'll have to track him down one day and talk to him. All right, uh, let's talk a little bit about food in the in town because we can't always eat pizza and stuff like that. What are your favorite breakfast places around here? Uh, my favorite and my most frequently visited are probably two different things. I. I am a regular at the Pancake House, especially when my dad is in town. Um, he wants to go out to eat every single morning that he's here, mm -hmm. and we probably go to the Pancake House at least 50% of the time. The, uh, they don't worry about uh, presentation or necessarily service um, on, on the actual food i mean it's it's good but they just it's a 
hot sloppy mess like i'm i'm thinking of their chilaquiles in particular uh-huh. or even their eggs benedict or or anything it's it's heavy and yeah. it's delicious and it's not the prettiest thing i've ever had but it is just as delicious as anything else but um you know for for special occasions and not quite such a gut bomb i find myself going to Lapa Lapa just because they have such an offering of what Vallarta in Mexico should be. I mean, it's it's a real classy Corona commercial down there. You get to put your toes in the sand. There's a beautiful bay breeze. The The waves are just gently lapping over in the background. And they, the, the food is beautiful, the food is delicious, it's expensive, um, but everything that I want in a breakfast, they, they, they do it for me. You know, I find their breakfast actually is, prob- is probably the most reasonable meal that they have there. And, you know, you can't beat sitting down there with a nice cloth tablecloth and the cloth napkins and sitting there with the... Los Muertos Pier right there. And it's, beautiful. It, it's beautiful. The service is good. The, the, for, for breakfast in particular, yes, it is not overly expensive. Uh, you can get a mimosa, which is key to going to, going to breakfast with my wife. Um, <laughs> so, so, yeah, they check, a, they check an awful lot of boxes over there. Okay. Um, any special dinner places you like? Um, one of my favorites is one of my good friends and inspirations down here. It's Joe Jack's Fish Shack. Like he is, uh, he started with basically a fish shack, and the and the pictures of that. It's no wonder that he got a little bit of a slow start because it did not look like anything special. But um, he has taken a very blue collar. Um, blue collar chef and cook mentality and uh is really starting to turn it into something more than that and he he is uh begrudgingly to him most famous for his fish and chips uh maybe maybe we need to edit that out (laughs) because he is definitely most famous for that dish but um he also is very proud of his cooking knowledge and heritage he lived in italy for several years oh. uh he's been at, worked at really fancy restaurants in san francisco and los angeles and now he lives full time down here and he's focused on that but generally speaking when i go to his place i order everything off the specials menu because it's something different it's something exciting and it's something that, generally speaking that he has put the most effort into handcrafting and and doing himself or, or having uh, a lot of his best chefs that are in charge of doing it. Does he make a great hamburger? Yes. Does he make a great fish and chips? Sure. Does he make a great everything else on his menu? Absolutely. But um, it's not, it, it's, it's really nicely done fancy versions of, uh, of pub food also, which is part of the reason why he can be so successful in my mind at lunch also, mm-hmm. because you don't, you don't want to go out and do fine dining. I mean, Cafe des Artistes is not open for lunch, right. as they shouldn't be. Um, uh, they got a lot of other restaurants like, um, for example, Barcelona Tapas, they're open for lunch and they have a really good offer really good offering but they really don't get busy until dinner because their food while it's not terribly expensive it it kind of scratches my fine dining itch so i always think of that as a as a dinner spot and uh and joe jack is doing some really good things to where he appeals to the lunch crowd appeals to the dinner crowd the only problem I have with it is I won't go there basically from the end of November through uh, last week um, because he's, he's established himself as a, as a go-to spot where a lot of people who 
either live down here or visit regularly, they're going to end up in his in his space, and that's why that's one of the main reasons why I view him as a, as such a mentor because he established the ability for a expatriate run business uh, be, being able to be very successful. And uh, while, he, while he doesn't have quite the, the Mexican clientele following that we have, he does, he does have that, mm-hmm. um, which, which, which I saw and uh, made one of, my, one of my biggest priorities in, in writing a menu and deciding what we wanted to do here was to be able to, to appeal to people who are here 12 months a year. Yeah, because you need to do that if you're going to be here 12 months a year, because otherwise, ain't no bueno. You ain't going to survive. It's right? not. It's not very fun working in an empty restaurant. Right. Uh, let's talk about your staff just a little bit. Um, is it is it hard keeping people um, on your staff? Uh, it was extremely hard for the first couple years, and that was partially their fault and partially our fault. Um, but as we grew and had more, st- uh, as we grew, our staff became way more stable. And now we also are busy sort of all the time. So everybody, everybody is earning an income 12 months a year. So um, we have a little bit of a problem where some of our po- employees always think the grass is greener. Mm-hmm. Um, or somebody will make them a promise of they'll they'll make three or four times the amount of income that they can make working here, um, and generally speaking, that's that doesn't come to fruition. And so long as we had an employee that left well, uh, they come back, and we've had uh, we've had a lot of return employees, and but at this point. Uh, our staff is very much stable. All of our most important members are, are very stable, very respectful of, of the business, their coworkers, of me, and uh, they're able to go out and put a great service forward every day, and we can rely on them. And I, a, a lot of people always... Uh, always question how I can stay open 365 days a year because they assume that I'm working 365 days a year. And that's not the case. Like I generally speaking work seven days a week, uh, but I don't necessarily work hard seven days a week. And if I'm out of town for a weekend or a month, I have people that I totally trust and they're able to put together an offering and while I don't think that they're stealing from me while I'm gone, um, my need to provide service to everybody all the time would almost be a sacrifice I'm willing to make because I, uh, I, I'm, a, I'm a big believer that hours of operation are the key to any restaurant retail business. Um, if you're going to close one day a week, it's always got to be the same day. Uh, if you're going to open at a time, you always have to open at that time. And we don't want, we don't ever want anybody to, to question whether or not we're going to be here and we're going to be ready. And, uh, and having, having a good, good, reliable staff is the key to that. What's your biggest challenge here? Uh, Mexican tax law. Tuck me. <laughs> you know, we, could, we could just stop there. We don't have to go any further than that. Mexican tax law. Okay. Very good. Um, if you had advice for a first-time visitor to Puerto Vallarta, what it, would it be? Don't book an all-inclusive hotel. Um, I mentioned uh, a couple of restaurants in, uh, previously, but um, Vallarta is a beautiful place. And there's a lot of excellent activities. There's a lot of excellent restaurants. There's a lot of excellent hole-in-the-wall bars. And um, book a nice hotel that you're going to be comfortable staying at. But get out of there. Like, if you if you really need to relax and all you want to do is sit on a beach chair and, and be waited on on the beach, then, then sure. But if you have any adventurous spirit whatsoever... Um, 
book something that doesn't include anything so you won't feel like you're leaving something on the table when you when you go out and and, and explore the town um also don't be afraid to ha- to eat a street taco um basically if you look if you f- find a street taco stand and there's a bunch of people standing there that means it's good <laughs> um and don't even necessarily educate yourself on the ingredients that you're eating and just try it and, and see, see what you think. I mean, generally speaking, uh, street taco is going to be around 13 pesos, give or take five pesos. Um, and just have one and try it. And when it's delicious, get another five and, and go for it. And then as you're halfway through, then start uh, spanglishing your way through understanding what you're eating. And, uh, and it'll, be, it'll, be a, it'll be a fantastic experience. Great idea. What's the favorite thing about this place for you? Uh, Vallarta? No, your place, Los Muertos Brewery. The, the, my favorite thing about Los Muertos is that everybody feels welcome here. And, um, and that beyond, beyond that, like I've also paved the way for brew pubs to exist down here. Yeah. When, we, when we were getting our license, um, we said we're going to make our own beer, and they, they, they looked at us like we were crazy. Like, why would you do that? There's, like, just get it from Modelo. Like, it's, it's fine. <laughs> and um, that's not the case. And when we finally said, well, Cabo has one of these brew craft brewery brew pubs and they said oh if Cabo has one then clearly we need one uh, and that sort of got us off there and uh, but in teaching the city how to write a license for us and teaching uh, Mexicans what a brew pub is the majority of our Mexican clientele does drink our beer not uh, not Pacifico we do offer Pacifico that's the only non Muertos beer that we offer but it's it's very much in the minority of our our product mix of beer sales, and now that we're here, another brewery has opened right around the block, and they're they're in business. They're doing well. They're making good beer. There's also another brewery up in Pitial that isn't necessarily a brew pub, but they're making some pretty good beer. And now there's breweries in Busarias that are opening up, and it's it, it's a really cool feeling to be sort of on the front of the a craft brewing out. yeah a craft brewing revolution or or something like that like it's a it's a cool thing to be able to just sort of travel back in time we're basically a brewery in the states in the early 80s where people didn't necessarily have a taste for craft beer didn't necessarily know what was going on and um and a lot of those places are have come and gone and a lot of those places are stronger than they've ever been and it's it's really exciting for us to to sort of be pioneers in in Mexico. Yeah. Well, wow. is um, is there anything we've missed? Is there something that you wanted to add in there, or you think we kind of covered it? I feel pretty good about it. Like people can. Um, well, yeah. How do, can, how do people find you? People can people can come in and and they'll learn a lot more. Um, our website is losmuertosbrewing.com. And uh, we're pretty easy to find. If you, if you search Los Muertos Beer or Puerto Vallarta Beer, um, Los Muertos Brewing Company is at the top of all those lists, at least, at least for now. That was knocking on wood in case you couldn't hear it in, uh, through the microphone. Um, but uh, but it's, it's a great place. Come down and see us if you haven't. Um, we try to get people in the door with our lunch special, which is 75 pesos for a slice of pizza, sli- uh, <laughs> fries, or a salad. I was trying to... Uh, it's like a slide of fries. Uh, 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 a, s- a salad uh, <laughs> or a, f- a flalad. Anyway, and that comes with a beer or a soda, and 75 pesos right now is probably less than $4. Yes. Um, so it's a, it's a pretty, pretty solid deal. 
you basically can have lunch and a beer for way less than you could get a beer for anywhere, anywhere back home. It's a uh, great es- deal. Especially a craft beer. Um, but, um, but yeah, it's, uh, it, it's a pretty exciting place to be. It's, the neighborhood is really catching fire around us. Had a couple people when we first started that said that we were crazy, that we were making this investment that we were in, in what they called the barrio. Uh, a barrio in Spanish doesn't really have a negative connotation, but in English it does. Um, so so they, they, they meant it negatively. Yeah. And, and now it's uh, the, the neighborhood has really grown up around us and a lot of, a lot of people are having a lot of success and, um, and people are having a really great time. We're, we've got so many new visitors and return visitors uh, to, to Los Muertos and to Vallarta in general. And it's... It, it's it's fantastic that um, that the press isn't negative about Mexico being unsafe because I do not feel I I, I moved down here uh, along uh, when when the, it was very much in the press that Mexico was unsafe and I yeah. never felt unsafe and I still don't to this day and um, it's it, it's refreshing that 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 perception is catching on with, with a lot of people again. Excellent. Well, Connor, I want to thank you so much for letting me introduce you to my, my listeners and, uh, of course, letting me introduce Cerveza Ria, Los Muertos. Well, it was a pleasure, pleasure chatting with you today, and thank you very much for the opportunity. All right. Thank you, Connor. Thank you so much. Wow. All of that great information about beer making is just making me thirstier and thirstier. You know what I'm going to do after this show? Anyway, he's a really great guy, and i got to tell you something. I was expecting a much more, well, mature guy, you know, an older guy, but this guy, Connor, is a really, really young man. I was so surprised. Anyway, he has built a really great business right, right there in the heart of the Romantic Zone on the south side in the Emiliano Zapata neighborhood of Puerto Vallarta. Now, I have a map. And I have links to the website, and I have his Facebook page there, and and much more, including pictures of uh, Los Muertos, and of Connor, and uh, the food, and links to things that Connor and I talked about. They're all there in the show notes. Um, I don't know if you know this, uh, maybe I should point out that Los Muertos, you know, brewing was named after the beach right down the street. Uh, Playa Los Muertos. I'll tell you that story another time. All right. Well, that should do it for this episode of the Puerto Vallarta Travel Show next week. Stay tuned for more on-the-ground reports from Puerto Vallarta, Mexico, with travel tips, great restaurant and excursion ideas, and more. But until then, remember that this is an interactive show where I depend on your questions and your suggestions about all things Puerto Vallarta. And if you think of something that I should be talking about, well, please reach out to me by clicking on the Contact Us tab and send us your message. And remember, if you're considering booking any type of tour while you are in Puerto Vallarta, you must go to vallartainfo.com, that's JR's website, and reserve your tour through him right from his website. Remember, this is a value-for-value proposition, my friends. His experience and on-the-ground knowledge of everything Puerto Vallarta in exchange for you're making a purchase of a tour that you do anyway. You're just doing it through him as a way of saying, thank you. Thanks, JR, for being our guide. It costs no more than if you were going to use someone else. So do it, really. And when you do take one of those tours, email me about your experiences. Maybe we can come on board and share with others what you liked or didn't like about the tour. Again, contact me by clicking on the Contact Us tab and sending off a message. And don't forget that he has his famous maps, his DIY tours, his revitalized happy hour board, and more right there. And I have links to all of those things in the show notes, actually just about everywhere, all over my website. So check it out. Now, once again, if you like this podcast, please take the time, like R2 did earlier, uh, and subscribe and give me a good review on iTunes, if you would. Uh, That way we can get the word out to more and more people about the magic of this place 
Puerto Vallarta, Mexico. Remember, I made it easy for you to do that with every episode I create. And if you haven't been to my website, shame on you. You really need to have a look. I have links to all the places that we talk about. I've got interesting pictures and more right there in the blog posts and in the show notes for each and every episode that I create. So check them out if you haven't already. All right? Okay. Uh, so, thanks to Connor Watts of Los Muertos Brewing. Check out those links, check out the map, check out the pictures, and uh, like I said, we're in the show. Uh, check out his great craft beer next time you're in Puerto Vallarta. Like he said, he's got six or seven different ones just waiting for you. So, get on down there and stop in, have a little bit of lunch. He's got that great lunch special. Stop for dinner, it doesn't matter. Get in there, drink, eat, be happy. All right. And thanks to all of you for listening all the way through this episode of the Puerto Vallarta Travel Show. This is Barry Kessler signing off with a wish for all of you to slow down, be kind, and live the Vallarta lifestyle. Nos vemos, amigos. Samba de Puerto Vallarta. Samba de Puerto Valle